Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Everyone enjoying ChefConf? Yeah, like this is my first one. I didn't know what to expect. They were like, hey, you, Ansible DevOps person, come speak at ChefConf. I'm like, okay, sure. Uh, literally, I've never used Chef before in my life. Like, that's the other thing. Like, I haven't even tinkered with it. So I have this, like, unfounded <laughs> stigma slash bias. Not against it, it's just I have this assumption. And you have all broken it down, so very good. Round of applause for yourselves. So if this works, ah, yes, so who am I? I work at SJ Technologies. I am a senior DevOps advocate. What does that mean? Well, I'm still figuring that out. No, I'm kidding. Um, I help you all embrace DevOps changes and cultural changes as well as kind of tooling and process changes. And I also do the technical side of that as well. So this is part of the helping you embrace things. Um, I'm also, you know, that's my day job. My not day jobs are I run a newsletter called DevOps-ish. It's cloud native, open source, DevOps type stuff. I'm a cloud native computing foundation ambassador. You might have seen me at the booth yesterday. And also an open source.com community moderator. Um, so we're going to talk about war. DevOps is not a war. Like, I think we can all agree that bullets hopefully don't fly in your office. If they do, let's talk later. I can figure out how to help you with that. Um, but I put this slide up here to indicate that I'm uniquely qualified, minus the toilet switch picture there, to talk about war. I did it for 11 years. Uh, I've been in the Middle East more times than I can count. I've been in Central America several times as well. So um, I understand conflict at all levels. It could be political conflict within an organization, or it could be actual bad guys doing things. <clears throat> I spent you know, like I said, a lot of time in fun places, as the uh, Air Force called it. Um, I got out in 2010 on a medical separation. I was injured in 2003 when the war started drawing down. It was time for me to go. Thank you. I appreciate it. So this hug life, right? Like, make DevOps, not war, folks. That's the idea here. So we're going to talk about conflicts, like I've mentioned. Conflicts occur in digital transformations all the time. Right, like if, if you're arguing with your security people, totally normal. What's not normal is, you know, no one wants to advance things in a better way. So, show of hands, who has gotten into a disagreement about how to implement a big change at work? Yeah, like everybody, pretty much. So, what if I told you there's a reason for that? And it's actually founded in history, like <coughs> real history. So let me introduce you to a gentleman named Thucydides. Thucydides, and for the last time, Thucydides. If you want to say it with me, we can. Thucydides. All right, now that we got that out of the way. Uh, he's a Athenian historian and general. Um, he wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, which is the war between uh, Athens and Sparta in 5th century BC. So he's not around anymore to tell us about it, obviously. Um, but he's unique in the sense that he used impartiality and real evidence gathering, as well as cause and effect in his works, as opposed to, oh, intervention by the gods, because that was totally accepted back then. You know, this, this is Zeus's fault or something. I don't know. <coughs> whatever whatever the, the previous war's history book said. Um, so pretty cool guy. He did a lot of studying into what caused the war uh, between Athens and Sparta. This is Graham Allison. He is with us still. Uh, you can hear him speak in many places around, but he's in the political uh, advisory, political affairs kind of scenario. Uh, he's actually a Harvard professor and, quote, American political scientist. He has a history, you know, degree, obviously, of some sort, and as well as poli sci. So why is he significant? Well, he's an advisor and consultant to the Pentagon. As a matter of fact, he's been there since the 60s. He's also a permanent member, which is rare, of the Secretary of Defense's policy board. He's been there since 1985. Ronald Reagan was in office. This guy's been there the whole time helping with defense policy. He's actually best known for his book on the Cuban Missile Crisis from 1971. 
he, Allison, Graham Allison, introduced a term called Thucydides trap. It's an orange bear trap for Chef Kampf. So I'm actually going to read it to you, not that I like reading my own slides. It refers to the natural inevitable discombobulation, there's your big word of the day, that occurs when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power. And this can happen in any sphere. Now, he's obviously talking about you know, political spheres of influence or you know, battlefields, that kind of thing. But intentions aside, when a rising power threatens to displace a ruling power, the resulting structural stress makes a violent clash the rule, not the exception. How do we know that? He studied 500 years of wars. Every explosion sign is an indication that a war occurred between two parties. Every peace sign is, or dove, peace sign. Um, Google with their emojis. Anyways, uh, every peace sign indicates uh, actual successful peaceful transition. Um, there should be an asterisk around the Cold War, I feel like, because of all the proxy wars. But anyways, um, as you can see, 75% of the time, war is the norm. So 12 out of 16 cases resulted in war. Uh, the, the four cases that avoided this outcome did so only because of huge, painful adjustments in attitudes and actions on the part of the challenge and challenger alike. So wait, what, you know, I'm DevOps, I'm doing, you know, I'm running Chef, I'm putting Habitat in place. Why do I have to make any concessions? I'm the future. <laughs> you be careful with that. Very dangerous position to take. Anyways, so let's talk about Dev and Ops. Holding hands, making s'mores by the campfire. Everything's going great now, right? Like Dev Ops, yeah, it's almost a decade old. We, we're doing it. Everybody agree with that in the room? Raise your hand if that's not the case. Yeah, I see head shaking. They're very, very, yeah. So here's the thing the divide is closing, though. I think we can all acknowledge that, right? Like people agree that moving faster and safer is a thing that is possible. Only kind of the outliers remain, right? It's the, it's the big industries that have been around for 150 years. You know, the, the greenfield stuff, they're talking advanced DevOps concepts on day one. Some folks, uh, potential client I just talked to, they're, according to one of their directors, uh, DevOps was a four-letter word last year. Like, don't even mention DevOps. Don't even say it. We're not doing it. They're coming around, though. DevOps is happening. This is the title slide of a request for proposal from the US Strategic Command. If you're not familiar with them, they are the ones that create the nuclear plans and execute them should a nuclear war or a nuclear exchange with another country break out in America. Now, long story short, they use eight inch floppies to load programs to send missiles into outer space and then put them on very finite dots in other countries. They needed to work, modernize. What did they say they wanted? Agile and DevOps. So congratulations, everyone. DevOps could end the world. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that. The US nuclear weapons program that's using eight inch floppies did not say, oh, we're going to do waterfall or we're going to do something you know, extreme programming, whatever it may be. We're, doing, we're just going to jump from that to DevOps, because we know that that's the way we need to be. And the proposal actually had, like, you can go to that link, take a picture of it if you want. It's live, right? Like, you can go to that proposal and see every piece of infrastructure they want to implement or are implemented already. It includes things like OpenShift and Ansible and all the things that come with Kubernetes, DevOps, Agile Practices, Jira, the whole nine yards. So one thing I hear often, oh, that won't work here. That might be great for Silicon Valley, but that won't work here. It's like, well, I've been to Silicon Valley exactly once in my life, and I've done DevOps for seven years. So explain that one to me. Um, if the US nuclear weapons program is embracing DevOps, you probably don't have an excuse, right? Like, digital transformation occurs everywhere every day. And if your organization isn't learning something new every day, you're going to fall behind. And you're probably already behind if you haven't started some kind of change. So your organization has no excuse. I really don't want to hear that this won't work here ever again after this talk, but I know I will. And I think we all know why. 
We just don't want to admit it because we're human. Fear. It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made war inevitable. Now, you, most of us have seen 300. Sparta's the warrior nation. You know, instead of you know, diplomatically doing things like they did in Athens, they went to war. Fine. Fear can lead to wars, obviously. Challenging the status quo can have horrible side effects, as I'm sure some of you that have tried to break down silos have learned. If you don't believe Thucydides and Alison Graham, I present to you Jedi Master Yoda. Fear causes resistance all the time. You know, oh, I don't want to put my kid in the back of the, the trunk because, you know, that's probably not safe. You have a fear of killing your kid, right? Like, that's, I get it. <laughs> fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. A lot of people have that fear of change. It is human nature. It's the rise of something new, DevOps, and the fear it instills in people that makes conflict possible. If that's the first thing you say to your security people, you probably just won something. And that might be, you know, one concession. Concession number one is I understand you have concerns. I understand that change is hard. But I'm here to discuss if you'd be willing to maybe automate some of your security scanning to not make this the thing that I have to go back and fix every time we do the router deployment. So let's look at an actual use case from history uh, of a peaceful transition of global power. Let's go way back, pre-World War I, not quite the Warring Twenties, but American GDP had already overtaken the entire British Empire. The British Prime Minister was actually quoted saying, a war with America, not this year, but in the not distant future, has become something more than a possibility. This is the early 1900s. The First Lord of the Admiral at, Admiralty in 1901 said, I would never quarrel with the United States if, possible, if I could possibly avoid it. Why? They had no allies in our hemisphere, none. The Monroe Doctrine pretty much said, this is our problem, we're here, and pretty much kept the British out. So they knew that they'd be fighting a war from the British Isles. Well, that worked out really well for them in the 1700s, I hear. So ultimately what happened is, quote, the special relationship, end quote, is formed. The U US and the UK have had the best relationship of any two nations in history, I feel like. I have served with British intelligence and communications people around the globe. They're excellent people. We work very well with the British. This is the UK at its territorial peak around 1912 to 14. This massive empire said, you know what, US, it's yours now. Because we've got issues that are brewing right on our shorelines called World War I. So at the time, everybody was related to each other, right? It was the king of something, the archduke of, you know, was it Bosnia? Sorry, my history is, oof. Anyways, so instead of uh, being provoked by the United States in the war, they said, we will make concessions. Panama Canal, great. It's going to be great for everybody. Built it. Um, <clears throat> when World War I came, the U.S. was an essential supplier of material to the U.K. Keep in mind, that was, what, 13 years after somebody said, you know, maybe we could go to war with these people? That took a lot of compromise and a lot of people swallowing their national pride. National pride. So DevOps, the war crime? That was actually the original title of this talk. Might have been a little strong. <laughs> um, so some people feel threatened by cloud, and fast changes, and embracing failure, right? Like, these are all great concepts to you and me, but we are, you know, looking around the room, very few of us have gray hair. Mo well, sorry, I'm not going to pick on you. Some of us don't have hair. And you, sir, with the gray beard in the back. I get it. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Remember, humans inherently feel fear change. People incessantly worry about their future. I do. I mean, I have anxiety issues about, like, well, if I do this, what happens next? Like, every time I, I tell my wife, every time I hit enter, 
I'm making a decision that could make or break a company. Uh, not quite that bad, but anyways. Most of the time it's, oh God, just give me some space. I don't want to see this crap anymore. Anyways, so if you recall, every talk in DevOps that felt like for you know a while, a few years ago, was about empathy, 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 empathy. That's still important, right? Like we might have moved on to more technical talks and more talks that embrace actual like stats, metrics, history to discuss change, but empathy is still a critical thing in DevOps. So let's talk about your networking teams, your security teams. The idea that uh, they can't join you on this journey is kind of like, like I can't imagine not working with a networking team trying to deploy an infrastructure nowadays. They're really smart at things that make up really core competencies in the cloud, right? Like VLANs, NATing, firewalls, well that's VPCs, right? Bring them along, connect the dots for them, help them embrace cloud technology. Help them become a hybrid environment. Help them learn. Make that concession. Move slightly slower to bring them up the speed so that you can accelerate faster as time goes on. If your security organization is the group of, nope, you're not doing that here, you're going to have a bad time. So bring those people in as early as possible. They're going to have a harder time but as folks see the gains of every time I commit code, it's getting a security scan done. It's getting a static analysis done. It's having vulnerability uh, assessments done on every library you've ever committed. That's amazing, right? Like they see huge value in that immediately. Look to leadership to bring them on board if need be, but have a good story already built. Give them a small example of, you know, oh yeah, we deployed this code to production. By the way, it, we it ran this Nessus scanner thing that we got off the internet for free for a 90 day trial or something against it before it deployed. Look what it's found and we fixed it and boom, now it's out in production or out in dev somewhere. DevSecOps is a term that I think some people are like, is it SecDevOps, is it DevSecOps, does it even need to exist? It does and here's why. Security is the most important thing that companies worry about nowadays, right? Like if you're a $2 billion company, you care about security. If you're a $200 billion company, you care about security probably more than that $200 billion company could ever imagine. So shifting security left and putting that in your pipeline earlier is a huge win. You have to convince your people of that. And DevOps isn't just for IT anymore. Business processes matter. You can deploy code all day long. Eventually your DevOps transformation will bump into these weird things called business processes and profit. You know, we all kind of like to make money. Uh, I mean, I do. I don't know, but your C-suite can help you, right? Like they can help you embrace a culture change. Your marketing teams can help you put on, you know, mini chef comps or mini DevOps days. Um, your legal team can help you negotiate contracts with vendors a lot faster than you ever could, right? Bring them in earlier. Your finance team, if you're doing anything in the cloud, having a shared common language between your team and your finance teams really helps. Helping them understand the AWS bill goes a very long way. Don't discredit the people that aren't writing code. That's the big takeaway. So you're either a learning organization or you're losing to one. Andrew Clay Schaefer said that years ago. And it still holds true today. If you're not learning from your mistakes, if you're not learning new things, if you're not embracing new concepts, you're gonna fall behind. We inherently value success and devalue failure. Why? Well, for years it was, oh great, you made 40 more cars in this production line. Well, great, those 40 more cars have 70% more defects. No, fix the defects first. Toyota, when I asked, how do you make so many cars a day? They said, well, we pull the Andon cord a thousand times a day. What did the Andon cord do, anybody? Stops the entire production line. And they have, what, less than a minute to address the problem or pull the whole thing out and fix it you know, long term? They fix mistakes a thousand times a day. That's real learning. We all agree that cars are better than horse and buggy, right? I, mean, hmm, I don't know. It's romantic, but then there's poop, so. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, figuring out a dud early is 
way more valuable than dumping millions into a failure, right? So failing fast is huge. There's a, a large banking institution based out of Detroit where I live that uh, spent six years trying to do this new thing that's going to change the entire company, and they just dumped it. So this isn't worth it. We'll start over, reorg the entire IT organization, and uh, embrace more DevOps and Agile practices. Six years, hundreds of people, millions of dollars. Didn't even produce a single thing. They just dumped it. Um, if you don't believe me about you know scanning earlier and putting things more you know safety driven earlier in your pipeline, check out Sidney Decker's works. Safety one versus safety two, literally lays out everything for you. It'll give you a good argument to go back to your company and say, hey, you know if we start doing these things internally, we will accelerate, not just be safer. So in conclusion. We know people feel threatened by DevOps. Let's, let's admit that now. Like if it's new to people, they are going to feel threatened by it. Finding allies and creating successes together is key. Early inclusion, inclusion in general is key, right? But doing that earlier is better. Failing fast is something that is important. Don't be like that bank in Detroit. Don't spend millions of dollars in years and time and effort and energy. Some people's you know, entire span of their career with that company has been this one thing and now it's gone. Be a learning organization. Thank you. <laughs>